uh, we are here at the House of Commons uh, and the Literary Circle uh, of London uh, who have conceived, coordinated uh, and essentially put everything together. I'm just here looking pretty as I always do, so thank you uh, to the Literary Circle for doing a huge amount of work behind the scenes uh, and putting this program together. Uh, I'll get on and make the formal welcomes uh, to uh, the very esteemed guests that are here. Uh, if I start with uh, Mr. Uh, Waleed Iqbal, uh, very fortunate to have him here and huge thanks to the Literary Circle for being able to secure uh, such a great guest. And I think we have a lot of guests in Parliament, but to have somebody of his stature, of his lineage and linkage. I'm grateful for his wife, Nuria, uh, to be here, their son, uh, Shamsher, uh, and the rest of his family members who made it here. So I'm hugely grateful for all of them for their forbearance. I'm sure uh, certainly the family would have found somewhere much better uh, to go, and certainly Oxford Street's not too far from here. So I do really appreciate uh, your, your being here, and thank you very much. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, another very special guest who has become, a very, in a very short time, uh, become a very good friend uh, and also a great advocate uh, for Pakistan. In a very short time in the office that he's had here, uh, he's been able to really sort of stretch across, uh, not just to the community and the diaspora across the country where I've seen him, I've seen him in action, I've seen him take him some very difficult questions, but more importantly, I've seen him be able to actually guide and, and take up those questions and issues and address them in a very small sort of time. Uh, and of course, being then able to reach out to the, uh, to the host community here and, and trying to actually put forward a far better uh, status of the country that he represents, Pakistan. And it's none other than Ibn, Ibn Abbas, the High Commissioner for Pakistan, Malkim, sir. Thank you. Alama Iqbal ke kanam se aaj ki mehfil shuru karenge. Sitaaron se aage jahan aur bhi hain. Abhi ishq ke intihaan aur bhi hain. Tahi zindagi se nahi ye khizaayin. Yahaan saikro karbaan aur bhi hain. Qanaat na kar aalam e rangu bu par. Chaman aur bhi. Aashiyaan aur bhi hain. اگر کھو گیا ایک نشیمن تو کیا غم مقامات آؤ پہا اور بھی ہیں تو شاہی ہے پرواز ہے کام تیرا تیرے سامنے آسمان اور بھی ہیں اسی روز و شب میں الجھ کر نہ رہ جا کہ تیرے زمان و مقام اور بھی ہیں گئے دن کے تنہا تھا میں انجمن میں یہاں میرے راستہ اور بھی ہیں I would now like to introduce Mrs. Gavar Singh. Gavar is an educationalist. She's been a head teacher for many years. Despite all her best efforts to retire for the last so many years, schools all over the country keep head hunting her to take charge of their schools. Gavar is also on the executive committee of an interfaith group called Roshni for Harmony and actively promotes dialogue between people of different faiths to live together with mutual respect and consideration. She believes that we need to move beyond tolerance and actually learn to respect each other. She's also the chair of Literary Circle London. So please join me in welcoming Mrs. Gullis Singh. Actually, I didn't recognize myself there, but <laughs> because you said it, I believe you. As the chair of Literary Circle London, I welcome you all. and. Thank you for reminding me in Eid Mubarak and Salam Alaikum. The Literary Circle was founded by three women, Sandra, Huma, and myself. Our main aim is to promote women. We want to increase the representation of women in organization at and at events. We want to have events that reflect the gender as well as the multicultural or pluralistic makeups of our society we live in. So we want the participation of people from diverse backgrounds as hosts as well as audience. We want to hold high quality events full of content, opposed to the gloss, uh, with fine speakers, poets and musicians. We want to hold our events with dignity and ensure that our speakers and other participants are properly remunerated. We want to set an example in terms of timekeeping precise organization of event, 
that maximizes enjoyment for everyone. So I'm going to cut my um, speech a little short at the end to make sure we catch up with the time. This event today where we are privileged enough to host the great Mama Akbal's grandson Bali on his own right as well, is also intended to reflect the truth that we are not a sexist organization and we want to work closely with supportive egalitarian men. Membership of TLC is easy, but it is not tender loving care, that is our <laughs> literacy circle. And all you have to do is to send an email to the literacy circle at hotmail.com and you become a member. There is no membership fee, and, it, and uh, as you can imagine in this time and day, there's nothing, as they say, no free lunch, but there's definitely free membership to our circle. We usually have ticketed events if the cost is high. We have two forthcoming events in the pipeline. One of, it, one of them is an interactive evening with an expert on D.H. Lawrence to revisit and discuss his classic controversial book, Lady Chatterley's Love. I'm sure nobody's heard of that. The second is a private and exclusive Mahfal Ghazal with Radhika Chopra. I also want to say on behalf of the Indians that we loved your grandfather, and we still do. He wrote a beautiful uh, piece I was just telling Wali just a few minutes before, Sare Jahan Se Achha Hindu Sita Hamara. And I remember I grew up singing that, and my great grandfather, uh, he said, Tuki Gandhi, you know, what do you sing? And he said, actually, he was, there was a Lalaji who invited Iqbal to uh, um, a big uh, organization to speak, and he stood up in, nine, I think he said 1904, yes. Uh, and he sang this for the first time. And since then, it is Indian, in, uh, almost English, uh, Indian um, uh, society, everybody, every main function we have that, and we sing it all the time. So, and I was uh, is sharing with you that all Indian people still uh, were privileged enough to know Urdu, um, who are not Muslim, still love Iqbal. And it was, you recently visited India, so I wasn't surprised that the Indian government has passed on the slave ward Iqbal, which he should have done a long time ago. Finally, in keeping with promoting our aims to represent women, and we are dedicating this lecture to great woman Nazia Hassan. Nazia Hassan, in whose memory we are holding this lecture, was herself the biggest representative of our aims. Despite finding stardom at the tender age of 15, she went on to complete her studies and eventually qualified as a lawyer. And this is why we chose to dedicate this lecture to her. She did more to bring India and Pakistan together than many politicians could or is doing. She became a household name overnight in both India and Pakistan after her phenomenal song, Aap Jaisa Koi Meri Zindagi Mein. She was the one Pakistani I know for sure who was loved by Indian after Iqbal, of course. Her sad, untimely demise left Indian as well as Pakistanis very sad. And we are united in our grief at her sad loss. Yet we, she lives through her son, Aris, uh, who's 18 years old now, as we mentioned. She lives through the foundation her mother has founded to keep her memory alive in all our, in all in our hearts as long as we are there. And I'm going to cut the rest of it, what we have done in our association to make our time. So thank you very much and welcome to you. Sandra Satterley. Sandra is a journalist and has worked covering stories around the world. She has a special fondness for Pakistan and has been there many times, most recently in April 2014, when she helped host a lavish dinner in honor of Professor Langdon at Aitchison College at the Royal Palm in Lahore. I am treasurer of the, um, the, the new literary circle of London. I have been tasked to introduce Iqbal, I'm so pleased to do so. As you all know here, he is renowned as a politician, lawyer, political speaker, um, an activist, and the grandson, most importantly, or perhaps alongside all the other accolades, of the great poet, Sir Alam Ma Iqbal. Because his profile is so well documented in the public forum, I'm going to draw on a few elements of this amazing life that are not there on the internet for everyone. 
Um, <clears throat> I'd like to say, perhaps, this is a total privilege because in the House of Commons, I think it is little known that Sir Dr. Alama Iqbal's, Iqbal is a famous poet and that he has a long legacy of, of family that have followed to some extent or another in his pursuit of freedom, equality, and justice. And I'd like to say that Walid has stood up and will continue to stand up for the face of equality and justice in Pakistan. And I would like to say he is a true patriot. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I in introduce Walid Iqbal. Thank you. My greetings, my Eid greetings, and good evening to you. I am immensely grateful, and I deem it a privilege and honor to be presenting this Nazia Hassan Memorial Lecture in this historical setting on the life and works of Alama Muhammad Iqbal. The last occasion that I remember that a major event in the United Kingdom took place concerning Alama Iqbal was in 2008 in Cambridge, where he studied um, around that time to celebrate his 100 years in Europe, because he finished his studies in 1908. And uh, funnily enough, his life is full of such milestones that he gives us some excuse or the other to link some milestone with another major event over here today. While preparing for this talk, uh, I've come across a little detail which is worthy of mention right at the outset, that this time, this year, a hundred years ago, was the time of publication of Alama Iqbal's first collection of poetry, which was called Asrar-e Khudi in Persian, which means Secrets of the Self. So, as we celebrate 100 years, as we commemorate Nazia Hassan and celebrate 100 years of Alama Iqbal's publication of Secrets of the Self for Asrar-e Khudi, Alama Muhammad Iqbal was born on the 9th of November, 1877 in the city of Sialkot, which is now in Pakistan's Punjab province. His father, Sheikh Noor Muhammad, was a tailor by profession and a pious individual with a mystic bent. His father had no formal education, but could read Urdu and Persian books and treasured the company of scholars and mystics, some of whom called him an, an unlettered philosopher. Alama Iqbal's mother, Imam Bibi, was illiterate, but was highly respected in the family as a wise and generous woman who quietly gave financial help to the poor and needy and arbitrated in neighbors' disputes. A few days before the birth of Iqbal, his father, Sheikh Noor Muhammad, had a dream. He says, I saw a big crowd gathered in a large field a magnificent colored bird was flying over our heads and everyone was ad admiring it and trying to catch it. But none succeeded. And at last, it got tired and fell into my lap. He understood this to be a message from God that he was about to bless him with the world famous son. Hence, the unlettered philosopher gave his son the name Muhammad Iqbal. The word Iqbal, whose origins lie in the Arabic language, means recognition, stature, respect, and fortune. Referring to his father's spiritual influence, he had, he had not, he said, he had not formed his view of life through philosophical investigation, but had inherited it. The influence of his first mentor, Sayyid Mir Hassan, was also formative. A committed and enlightened scholar, he instilled the love for the Islamic heritage and also introduced, this is important, he also introduced Iqbal to modern learning. And Iqbal was not one to forget this. In 1922, when he was being offered the knighthood by the British government, he made his acceptance conditional upon recognition of his first mentors Mir Hassan's scholarship. When he was asked, what books has Sayyid Mir Hassan authored? Iqbal replied, 
I am the book he has authored. And when Iqbal was conferred the knighthood in 1923, his first mentor, Mir Hassan, received the title of Shamsul Ulama, which means the son of the scholars. <laughs> Most importantly, Iqbal's poetry receives a new direction through his association with the Society for the Support of Islam, the Anjuman Himayat Islam, which was established in 1884 to offer financial aid to students, widows and orphans, and to help poor people to stand on their own feet by giving them, giving them vocational training. The Society for the Support of Islam, the Anjuman Himayat Islam, used to have annual fundraising events, which were widely attended. The Society's annual meeting on the 24th of February 1900, 23-year-old Iqbal was present, was noteworthy. He famously read his poem, The Orphan's Lament, in, Ur in Urdu called nala e yatim A budding young writer who was present in the audience documented that. He said, Iqbal stood up and took his place. He was a thin, fair-skinned and handsome, bespectacled man who had adorned a black achkan and a Turkish fez over his white shalwar kameez. The subject of his verse bore sadness. His language was simple, his voice loud and clear, and his powerful delivery created pin-drop silence. When he drew his picture of the pitiful conditions of the orphans, all eyes were filled with tears. Thereafter, in his poem, when he presented the orphans before the Prophet Muhammad, the audience started howling and screaming in sorrow. And when finally the Prophet Muhammad appeals for the orphans' aid, every pocket in the audience was emptied in contributing to the cause. The audience was so moved. The audience was so moved that Iqbal was asked to reread his entire poem. And the society's fundraising raising event, needless to say, that year was more than successful. This also won Iqbal tremendous acclaim and he became instantly famous. In this time, Iqbal also wrote and published his first Urdu book. It was not a collection of poetry. It was a book on the principles of economics, Ilmul Iqtasar, in 1903. And under Arnold's tutelage, Iqbal the poet now became Iqbal the academic. He taught and wrote prolifically on a range of diverse subjects. Arnold motivated Iqbal to pursue higher studies in the West. And Iqbal had probably already begun the process of intellectually synthesizing the Eastern and Western traditions. He had already gained recognition as an accomplished poet and thinker in pre-independence India. And according to his, in the words of his biographer Mir, in the fertile, fertile soil of Lahore, the sapling of Sialkot had become a sturdy tree. The third phase of his life comes between 1905 and 1908. In 1905, Iqbal arrived in Cambridge, entering Trinity College as a research scholar. Cambridge was then a renowned center of Arabic and Persian studies. Its luminaries included Reynold M. Nicholson, who later translated Iqbal's Persian poem, work, Asrar-e Khudi, same one which was first published in 1915, into English in 1920. And uh, that publication, by the way, uh, introduced Iqbal into the West as a major Muslim thinker as well, which was 1920. Uh, Iqbal met with the philosopher John McTaggart and attended his lectures on Western thought. He also enrolled as a student of law at Lincoln's in London and at Sir Thomas Arnold's suggestion, registered as a doctoral student at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich in Germany. In 1907, in June 1907, Iqbal earned an MA from Cambridge. In November 1907, note the years, in November 1907, Munich University awarded him a PhD for his thesis in the development of metaphysics in Persia. In July 1908, Iqbal was called to the bar at Lincoln's in London. Thus, in three intense years, Iqbal remarkably earned three degrees from three prestigious institutions. A master's degree from Trinity College, Cambridge, a doctorate from Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich and a bar at law from Lincoln's in London, which none of his famous contemporaries like Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Mahatma Gandhi, 
or Pandit Nehru could accomplish in such short time. He also acquired a sound knowledge of German language. Already familiar in translation, now he was in a position to make a first-hand, in-depth study of the German philosophical and literary tradition. In 1926, he was elected as a member of the Punjab Legislative Council, now known as the Punjab Assembly, the Provincial Assembly, a position he retained until 1930, so he had practical experience of electoral democratic politics as well. He played an important role in determining the course of the All India Muslim League, which was to become India's largest Muslim political party. He also spoke for the need of a separate electoral system for Hindus and Muslims in India. In December 1930, at the annual meeting of the All India Muslim League held at Allahabad, he delivered the famous presidential address in which he proposed the creation of a separate Muslim homeland for at least the Muslims of Northwest India. In 1931, he represented the Muslims of India at a meeting of the World Islamic Congress held in Palestine. In 1931 and 1932, he again represented India's Muslims in the roundtable conferences in London, held to decide India's political future. In 1933, Iqbal traveled to Afghanistan at the invitation of Nadir Shah, who wished to consult him about Afghanistan's political system. Although he did not live to see the creation of Pakistan in 1947, he is revered as its spiritual father and its national poet. Iqbal died in Lahore at about dawn on the 21st of April, 1938, some months shy of his 61st birthday. His funeral, which was led by the Imam of the historic Badshahi Mosque at Lahore, Maulana Ghulam Murshid, was attended by more than 50,000 people. He is buried beneath the high walls of the Badshahi Mosque Lahore in a simple mausoleum designed by Nawab Zain Yar Jung of Hyderabad Deccan, the exterior of which is made of red sandstone imported from the city of Dholpur in India, and the white marble inside is gifted by Nadir Shah of Afghanistan. Iqbal is often called a pan-Islamist, but this can be misleading. Iqbal wished to unify the Muslims of the world, but their unification, in his view, would have a spiritual rather than a geographical basis. He nowhere proposes that the existing Muslim countries should abolish their borders and create a universal Muslim state ruled by a single caliph. He grants the possibility of the simultaneous existence of many Muslim states and many Muslim rulers. It is well known that for a period of time, Iqbal was a proponent of Indian nationalism, but political developments in the country led him to remark that India's most difficult problem is the communal problem, namely the problem of the conflict-ridden relationship between Hindus and Muslims. Eventually, he was convinced that the essential disparity between the two cultural units of India would not permit the hoped-for coexistence. Hence the historical address in 1930 in Allahabad in which he proposed the creation of a state for the Muslims of India. Besides that, Iqbal also took practical steps to unite Indian Muslims under one political banner. In the first place, he strove to make the All India Muslim League the representative political party of the country's Muslims. Secondly, he was instrumental in persuading Muhammad Ali Jinnah to again become active in practical politics and provide much needed leadership to India's Muslims. In emphasizing the preservation of Muslim cultural identity as the first priority of India's Muslims, he also advises the All India Muslim League, in order to be successful, ought to rely on Muslim masses rather than on elite Muslim groups. <clears throat> I close by quoting from some excerpt from the biographer Mustansir Mir from what he refers to as Iqbal's legacy, and I quote from now until the end. It is generally granted that Iqbal is both one of the most significant and one of the most influential Muslim writers and thinkers of modern times. Iqbal's greatness consists in interpreting the spirit of Islamic culture in a way that shows Islam to be a dynamic, forward-looking, and all-encompassing movement <coughs> that not only has profound meaning for those who believe in the religion, but also promises to serve as a force for good in the world at large. In the history of modern thought, when that history deigns to recognize the merit of the works of non-Western thinkers, Iqbal will be remembered as one who mounted a spirited defense 
of the possibility of a religion in a so-called scientific age. But perhaps Iqbal's most enduring legacy consists of his zestful affirmation of life. A study of Iqbal's life reveals that he was interested in practically everything that life had to offer. He read much, he dreamed much, and he hoped much. He corresponded with many people, as he had made close friendships with many people from many different communities and nationalities. And above all, he was open to new ideas. His readers find his works, works to be inspiring. No less inspiring to them is his decidedly positive attitude to life. I thank you. I will thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being very patient here, uh, listeners, for being a, a wonderful, uh, you know, supportive audience. Because uh, I think uh, it, uh, it this was, uh, you know, a very important discourse. But with this um, uh, late hour, I don't want to go further. And once again, I would like to thank uh, the Nazia Foundation, Nazia Sin Foundation, her mother. Uh, let me uh, share with you, ladies and gentlemen, that she was, of course, the very iconic figure, cultural figure of Pakistan. We regret, you know, she passed away at a very young age, but thank you to the Nazi Hassan Foundation for keeping her memories alive. And also, I just learned that, you know, this uh, literary circle is being run by three wonderful ladies here, uh, Huma Price, Kamal Singh Saba, and Sandra. Sandra, you said he was very humble, but let me share with you, not he, he is very humble, but humility runs in the family. Yeah. Even the Dr. Iqbal was a very simple person. He led a very simple life because he preached what he believed in, not that what he did not believe he preached. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, please. Very quickly, moving on. I think in such a time where the marriage of both religion and domestic law is relevant to our nations, I feel that the message preached by one of the greatest Islamic poets, if not, one of, if not the greatest Islamic poet, is timeless and is more relevant now than ever before. I feel, for me, who's 18 and just finished my studies, it gives a new dimension to not only philosophy, but science. Because, as Stephen Hawking says, what is science without the belief in God? And I feel that's you know, been emanated through today, and intrinsically, is a message that we can all learn from, and thank you for an amazing evening. The way I look at it, Khaled, as he says, he's been really like my younger brother from the times we needed him for Nadia Sen Foundation. Your story, I have said, and I am really very impressed by our ambassador. Mm -hmm. He and his wife, mm -hmm. the way they have met people and the way they have won their hearts, it's really exceptionally, exceptionally wonderful. Yeah. And I think thank you everyone. I, I, I haven't seen uh, audience like that. We are the same people who talk and you know, we shout and we eat and drink and whatever. But today, it must be because of you. It was wonderful the way everyone listened to it and remembered what to say, what to ask. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Absolutely. all of us really enjoyed the event. Uh, and I think in conclusion, just say uh, a big thank you to the lead staff. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.